Uh, welcome to the first uh, public lecture by the School of Physics for the fall semester. Uh, tonight, uh, our speaker is a guest of the Society for the Women in Physics, and we have Zoha Nakawif, representing the Society of Women in Physics, to give our introduction. Hi, my name is Zoha, and I'm the tre current treasurer for the Georgia Tech Society of Women in Physics. Um, we're a club that promotes diversity, inclusivity, and leadership in the Department of Physics. Today, I'm honored to welcome our guest, Dr. James Kakalius from the University of Minnesota to speak today about the, um, sci the physics of and material science of superheroes. Dr. Kakalius is an experimental condensed matter physicist with an emphasis on complex and disordered systems. And he is known for his, um, for his book, The um, Physics of Superheroes, and he recently published another book, The Physics of Everyday Things. Things. <laughs> well. Everyone give a round of applause for Dr. Kakili. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Can people hear me okay? Yes. Right, do I sound feedbacky or anything? Okay, great. Awesome. So um, thank you all for coming. It's a beautiful day outside, beautiful fall day. Um, I know that things are very hectic the week before your fall break, and yet you took time out to come inside and listen to a talk about physics and superheroes. You're my kind of folks. <laughs> Nerds. <laughs> so I hope that this will be um, entertaining, and if not, at least educational. So let me begin uh, with a background of how did a mild-mannered physics professor become associated with Spider-Man and Superman. In my day job, I'm a condensed matter experimentalist. So experimentalist means I have a laboratory as opposed to doing theory, and condensed matter is a fancy way of solid, saying solid state physics. My research actually goes from the nano to the neuro. We work on making composite, amorphous, and nanocrystalline semiconductors in order to make new materials for solar cells or thin film transistor applications. And I have collaborations with professors in neuroscience where we use techniques we developed to study electronic noise in amorphous semiconductors and applying them to voltage fluctuations in the brain. But that's not why I'm here today. I'm here today because back in 2001, I created a freshman seminar class at the University of Minnesota that was originally called Everything I know about science, I learned from reading comic books, which my colleagues say explains a great deal. <laughs> now, this is an actual real physics class that covers everything from Isaac Newton to the transistor. But there's not an inclined plane or pulley in sight. Rather, all the examples come from superhero comic books, and as much as possible, those cases where the superheroes get their science right. Um, I show here. Uh, a cover from an old action comics featuring uh, Superman visiting a college campus that I bought back in the 1960s for the grand total of 12 cents, just to indicate how very old I am. And uh, even as a kid, I knew that this part wasn't too accurate. But there were things, because I, I, I bought this, because I wasn't even collecting Superman at the time, but I was really interested in what life in college was going to be like. Perhaps I had a premonition that once I got in, I was never getting out. <laughs> and I knew, that, I knew that these things, the Superman here, wasn't too accurate. But there were things in the story that did turn out to be a correct representation of life in college. Namely, all professors at all times always wear caps and gowns. <laughs> and all professors are 800-year-old white men. <laughs> So uh, the freshman seminar was a success. And then in the spring of 2002, the first Spider-Man movie was going to open, the one with uh, Tobey Maguire, directed by Sam Raimi. And I thought, this would be a good opportunity to get some real science into the newspaper. So I wrote an essay about how the death of Spider-Man's girlfriend, Gwen Stacy, in, as you all know, Amazing Spider-Man number 121, uh, turns out to be a textbook illustration of forces in motion. The uh, 
This was published in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, my local newspaper, and the University of Minnesota press office put out a little press release saying, well, Spider-Man's on the big screen, but if you want to know about the science of superheroes, the person to ask is Professor Jim Kekelius. He teaches this freshman seminar, blah, blah, blah. The university has put out press releases about me before, about my work on amorphous semiconductors and electronic noise. Result, zero. <laughs> you write one story about Spider-Man, however. So this article was published on Friday. The Spider-Man movie opened on Friday. The press release went out on Friday. By Monday, there were calls from the BBC, CNN Headline News, the London Times. The Associated Press came to my office, where I just happened to have these lecture demonstration tools on hand. <laughs> that was a lucky break. Um, at this stage of my life, I reconciled myself to the fact that I could win three Nobel Prizes, and I know what photo they're using in my obituary. <laughs> I say this to my colleagues. They say, win three Nobel Prizes how? In a crap game? <laughs> uh, but this article actually went around the country. This is a clipping from the Chicago Sun-Times that my sister-in-law sent me. And it actually went around the world. Uh, here's a clipping that one of the graduate students brought back from Turkey, where I think I know what they're saying about me. And then I started showing up in places that physics professors don't usually appear. So right now, you know, you're in the midst of your studies and everything, but next week is break, ball break, and maybe you want to just relax with your family and have family game night or so. So I'm telling you right now that if you play Trivial Pursuit, you want to get volume six so that it, that way, if you get card 291, the science question, the answer is kryptons. The question is, what planet's gravity did science professor Jim Kekalius estimate by calculating the force needed to leap over an Earth building in a single bound? Now, I didn't even know about this. One of the graduate students came up to me and showed me the card. So I borrowed the card, and I went down to my main office, and I went to my department chairman, and I showed him the card, and I said, Alan, who's the most famous scientist you know? <laughs> And he looked at the card, and he looked at me, and he said, Stephen Hawking, <laughs> <laughs> who's not a genius. Oh, well, then it's you. <laughs> but um, the comic books actually get their science right more often than you think. My, I'm not trying to um, explain the superpowers themselves, because they're clearly physically impossible. And I'm not going to go around just saying, well, this could never happen, and this is impossible, and What's the deal with the Hulk's pants, anyway? <laughs> Unstable molecules. <laughs> uh, but rather, let's grant each character a one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature and say, well, if you were super strong or could stretch like a rubber band or could run at super speed like The Flash or Dash from the movie The Incredibles, could you run across the ocean or up the side of a building, drag people behind you in your wake? All things that the character is shown doing from, in the comics, using their superpowers, all things that are correct from a physics point of view, once you make that suspension of disbelief. Um, here we see The Flash, a DC comic superhero who has the ability to run at super speed. And a crook is shooting at him, but The Flash is faster than a speeding bullet, so this is not a problem. But there are innocent bystanders in the way. And The Flash is not bulletproof. He's not invulnerable, he's just really fast. But we see here, with a sweeping motion, the flash plucked them, the bullets, right out of the air before they could harm him. And over here is a little box that says, editor's note, Flash's action in stopping the bullets is similar to that of a baseball fielder who stops a hot grounder by letting his glove travel momentarily in the same direction as the ball. This is correct. This is a correct use of super speed to stop a speeding bullet. Just the other day, I picked up an object going 600 miles per hour when I poured myself some ginger ale on the airplane. It's going 600 miles per hour. I'm going 600 miles per hour. Not a problem. If it's going 600 miles per hour and I'm standing still, then I have a problem. So here we get some correct science in a superhero comic book. 
Uh, it, you can even get some advanced topics. Here the flash is trying to run at the speed of light, but he's having some difficulty. And this little box says, the mighty monarch of motion pours it on. They always had these great alliterative nicknames for the characters. The Flash was the Scarlet Speedster, the Crimson Comet, the Viceroy of Velocity. <laughs> <laughs> and the, but the Flash is finding it difficult to run at the speed of light. He's thinking, it's taking me a little longer than usual to reach light velocity. I wonder if I'm tired or something could affect my super speed. Good gosh, there's no doubt of it. I'm slowing down. I'm going slower and slower despite all my efforts. I can't go any faster because I'm getting heavier. Something's happening to me. Now, those who know Einstein's special theory of relativity know exactly why the flash is getting heavier as he tries to run at the speed of light. An alien is shooting him with a gravity increasing ray. <laughs> but if you take it out of context, it's a beautiful illustration of Einstein's principle. One more example with the flash, just because I love this one. It's so silly. Here, um, because of some silly reason, he can't touch anyone without killing them. I've read it several times. I still don't know why. But anyway, he wants to catch a bank robber, but he doesn't want to kill him. He just wants to turn him over to the police. So he does some creative problem solving, as we do in science. And at this moment, the scarlet speedster is a half mile away, racing around a pear tree. And he's thinking, by setting up a current of air, I've shaken those pears off their branches. Now, by racing swiftly back to the car, I'll start a suction to draw the pears after me, right? The Bernoulli effect. And then I'll duck down, and the pears traveling at high speed will do my job for me, thereby illustrating Newton's third law of motion, which is usually expressed for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, or another way to put it, forces come in pairs. I don't need your pity. <laughs> I heard those groans. So let me just remind you that I am a teacher. Therefore, your hatred only makes me stronger. <laughs> now, this may sound like a silly premise, but there's actually something serious that I, I'm trying to accomplish here. It will no doubt come as a shock to the students at Georgia Tech. But some of my students actually find physics dull. I know, I know, I'm just as shocked as you. This was driven home to me when I overheard two students leaving the physics building. They clearly just had an exam returned to them. I'm going to repeat exactly what I overheard, but in deference to my Georgia Tech hosts, I'll clean it up. The taller student said to his friend, I'm going to bleeping buy low and bleeping sell high. I don't need to know about no bleeping balls thrown off no bleeping cliffs. <laughs> now, I maintain that there's at least three nuggets of wisdom contained in these two lines. The first, of course, the secret to financial success. <laughs> so if you get nothing else out of this evening's talk, at least you now know buy low, sell high. <laughs> the second. For those of you who are scholars of English grammar and usage will have noticed that bleeping can be both an adjective and an adverb, <laughs> though I suspect some of you knew that already. And of course, the third is that many students don't find their introductory physics classes relevant, which is summarized in the standard student's lament, when am I ever going to use this in my real life? Interestingly enough, whenever I use superheroes to illustrate physics principles, Students never wonder when they're going to use this in their real life. <laughs> Apparently, they all have plans after graduation that involve spandex and patrolling the city. And knowing as I do how many mad scientists there are out there, that's probably a good thing. But the superheroes are really there just to illustrate the physics principles. Once we get the physics principles, I show how they are useful in real life, from everything how airbags save lives to how cell phones work. So I'll give you some examples here today. And hopefully you're so busy enjoying your superhero ice cream sundae that you don't notice that I'm sneakily getting you to eat your spinach at the same time. <laughs> now, 
I do want to make a point, and especially in, in, in honor of my hosts. Superheroes in physics back in the 1960s had one thing in common, a lack of diversity. <laughs> and there is in science a growing effort to expand the talent pool in all of the STEM fields. And this is not a question of political correctness, but it's really an issue of we have such challenging problems facing us that we need all hands on deck. And everyone, anyone needs to, that can contribute, we need their contribution. And it's interesting that while science is working on this, the comic books seem to have gotten there first. Because compared to when I went to the comic book store back in the 1960s, now when you go to the comic book store, you see that Captain America is Sam Wilson, uh, that Thor is Jane Foster, that the Hulk is Amadeus Cho, that Iron Man is Riri Williams, that Spider-Man is Miles Morales, Ms. Marvel is Kamala Khan, and the Thing is still Ben Grimm. But now we know, actually, it's been revealed, and it's part of canon, that the Ben Grimm is Jewish, which wasn't a point back in the 60s. And actually, when he was fighting a villain, this came up. And the villain said, wait, you're Jewish? And he said, yeah, why? And he goes, you don't look it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, this, is, this interest on diversity is perhaps not surprising, considering that the first superhero was an immigrant, as we all know, Superman. Right? Came to our shores from a distant planet to have to, for a better life. One, and one of the things that I want to talk about, and she'll show up throughout the talk, is the unbeatable squirrel girl, um, <laughs> Doreen Green. I just love this comic. First of all, she has all the powers of a squirrel and all the powers of a girl. <laughs> and she is a college student that is majoring in computer science. And her computer science Su subjects frequently come into the story in one story for reasons that are too convoluted to get into. She needed to be able to count off numbers from uh, up to like double digits using the fingers of one hand. And so the comic book taught everyone how to count to 31 using the fingers of one hand using binary. And two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, two to the four, you, two to five, you put them all together, you got. 31. And you can do it like this or this. And anyway. Um, also, what I like uh, about it is um, physics seems to be showing up in, I actually wrote to the comic book and I said, this is, I love your comic and this is great, but you only show Doreen going to computer science classes. And as we all know, no matter what your major is, you're forced to take physics at some point. And uh, just around that time, someone had interviewed me for uh, a story about the physics behind superheroes and punching. And then Doreen, a few months later, is trying to decide whether she needs to skip class and go off and fight crime. And they walk into their class, and they see that today's lecture is the physics of punches. And then she says, offer rescinded. I forgot how physics is totally amazing. So I hope to show you how physics is totally amazing today. Um, I will start off by talking about Spider-Man. Uh, as you all know, created in 1962 by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, Peter Parker, a uh, high school science student, uh, was bitten by a radioactive spider. Does not get radiation poisoning and die, but <laughs> rather gains a set of fantastic abilities with which he fights crime as the amazing Spider-Man. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is Spider-Man and wall crawling. So uh, let's look at how Spider-Man, let's see, come on, there you go. Uh, Spider-Man, one of his powers is that he can cling to any surface and move around. And initially in the comics, it was just explained because he has spider powers, that's why. But now we actually know how something like this could come about because we've actually looked, we, meaning other scientists, not me, <laughs> have studied gecko lizards and have tried to figure out how gecko lizards are able to climb 
and walk up the wall and across the ceiling. And how they do it, by you look at the gecko and you look at its feet and you zoom in and you see these pads and you zoom in on the pads and as you go in more and more and more, you find millions on each little pad, on each, on, on its, on each foot, there are millions of microscopic little filaments, little fibers. And that is actually the secret to the gecko's clinging ability. You have a microscopic filament and you bring it close to the wall. And there are fluctuating electric charges in the filament that induce an opposite electric charge in the wall. And sometimes the negative turns into a positive, but then the charge in the wall turns into a negative. So they, this cling is weak. It's called the van der Waals attraction because it's, just due, it's not due to real static charge. It's not as if the gecko has to rub its feet against the shag carpeting to build up a large static charge before it tries to walk across the wall. It's just a fluctuating charge. But that's why the, the filament has to be microscopic because it needs to get very close to the wall for this to work. And this is why you, we need millions of them, because it's very weak. So you need lots of them to help support the weight of the gecko. That's how a gecko does it. But someday soon, that's how we'll do it. Because scientists are developing gecko tape that is, that is an adhesive tape that has no glue but has just millions of microscopic fibers. And this is actually not taken from my office collection. This is a photo that was in, published in Nature Materials by Andre Guim, who would go on to get the Nobel Prize, but not for his action figure collection, um, for his work on graphene, uh, demonstrating that this action figure is being held up with this gecko tape. Now, there are real problems in getting something, gecko tape, such that it could support a person's weight as opposed to uh, an action figure or a gecko. But I'm telling you right now, this is my solemn vow, that they're, if they're ever able to scale this up so it could support a person's weight, I'm never waiting for the elevator again. <laughs> uh, we can also talk about web swinging with Spider-Man. One of the things in the Spider-Man comics is that he has, uh, can he swing from a thread? Uh, actually, yes. That he has made this artificial fluid that when it's aerosolized, turns into a thin filament. And this filament is extremely strong, uh, can hold him up as he swings. It, he can turn into a fine spray, or depending on how he presses that, that ejector button in his palm, it can turn into an adhesive liquid. And if this is as strong as real spider silk, then it will definitely do the job. Real spider silk is five times stronger than steel cable pound for pound and stretchier than nylon. It achieves this strength by having nanocrystals of proteins that are very strong and rigid. It achieves the elasticity by having polymers connect the nanocrystals so that it provides the stretchiness. And the whole thing is in a fluid-filled channel to uniformly distribute the forces along the line. So scientists are, would dearly love to be able to artificially make spider silk in the laboratory. Because then we'd be able to make lightweight clothing that would be stronger than Kevlar. They're unable to do this. Some scientists have taken a different tact. If you can't synthesize it in a chem lab, maybe what we could do is we'll take the web-making gene from spiders and transplant it into goats, presumably because it's too hard to milk a spider. <laughs> but, um, and they've done this, and the spiders produce uh, the goats, excuse me, the goats produce spider silk in their milk, which can be then sieved out and collected. Now, we'd like to know how strong the spider web actually is. And we know how we do this in material science. You basically see how much force it takes to reach failure. 
Right? You keep adding force until it fails. So fortunately, this has been done for us in, here we go, has been done for us in Spider-Man 2. Here, Peter Parker is on a runaway, runaway elevated train. And so he shoots out a number of web lines. And they're getting struck, they're stretching and stretching. Now they're starting to break, but we can still calculate by how far it stretches before the kinetic energy of the car is converted to zero. And we can figure out how much work was done by the webbing. By the way, I see that look in class a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So you've got all the, the necessary information to do this homework problem. Right? We, estimate the, we can estimate the diameter of the webbing. There were some close-up shots of the webbing, so we could figure out what that was. We can count the number of web lines. We can look up the mass of an elevated train. We can figure out its initial velocity by seeing how long it took to pass the buildings when it was first going. Uh, we can calculate by looking at how many blocks it went. We can estimate the distance over which the webbing stretched and uh, before it stopped the train. And all of this indicates that the webbing had to have had a tensile strength of about 1,000 megapascal, which is equivalent to 145,000 pounds per square inch. Steel cable only has a tensile strength of 250 to 500 megapascal. Spider silk has a strength of 1200 megapascal. So if you learn nothing else from tonight's talk, remember, they couldn't put it in a movie if it wasn't true. <laughs> By the way, while spider silk is incredibly strong, pound for pound, uh, it's a very distant cousin to carbon nanotubes, which have a tensile strength of 60,000 megapascal. And uh, carbon nanotubes, just a little digression on that. You take pencil lead, graphite, which seems like one of the softest materials around. And it's, it is at the same time that it's one of the strongest materials around. The, Graphite is just sheets of carbon arranged in hexagons. And every carbon atom then in, the, in this sheet has three chemical bonds. But I don't have to tell you guys, carbon likes four chemical bonds. So the carbon atom is bonded to the plane above, but then that means that there's no bond to the plane below. So really, there's only half a bond above and half a bond below, which is why Graphite is great for pencils because as you're pushing it, you just unravel the material carbon layer by carbon layer. You push hard, you pull off a lot of layers, and it is a dark mark. You push lightly, you only peel off a few layers, and you get a light pencil mark. Uh, here's a scanning tunneling microscope. These are, as you all recognize, carbon atoms <laughs> arranged in that hexagon pattern. If you take a single sheet of graphite, this is called graphene. It has all sorts of fascinating properties. It is actually a much better electrical conductor than anything else. The graphene, the bonds in this carbon between the carbon atoms in this single sheet are stronger than the bonds between carbon and diamond. So within the plane, graphite, the, each single plane, has bonds that are stronger than diamond. If you were to take this sheet and roll it up into a tube, you'd have a carbon nanotube. 
if you were to take a, a bunch of carbon nanotubes and braid them all into a cable, a cable that is no larger than a period in the sentence in any book that you have would be strong enough to hold up two SUVs. So if you could manufacture this on a long length scale, and we don't know how to do it, so that's why I'm leaving it as an exercise for you guys. <laughs> I'm serious. You guys are going to have to figure this out by Friday. <laughs> you guys have to figure this out. Um, if you could figure out how to make this on long length scales and braid them all together, you could have, this would be the material that could form the, car, the cable for like, you know, a space elevator because it would be strong enough to, to hold it up, to withstand those pressures, those forces. Um, a single layer of graphene is also very strong. You have a sheet of paper and you're holding a sheet of paper and it just, excuse me, and it just flaps due to gravity, right, under its own weight. If you had graphene, it would stay rigid and it would remain rigid and undeflected if any two people in the audience were to stand on the end. That's how strong graphene is. I know how strong graphene is because even Iron Man is using it. So a few years ago, Iron Man uh, changed his uh, suit of armor from the traditional red and, and yellow, red and gold, into something that looks like he stepped out of the Apple store. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the modifications he made to his suit was that he got rid of the faceplate so that the adoring public could see his face, which has its downsides, namely when someone wants to shoot you point blank in the face. But Tony Stark is unharmed. And the gunman is mystified, but Tony explains, it's called graphene, stronger than most steels, transparent. Well, it's only one atom thick. So 97% of all light would pass through it. So graphene is indeed transparent. So the question is, is graphene really bulletproof? And the reason I bring this up is that the very same week that that issue of Iron Man came out. Another scientific journal <laughs> came out, Science Magazine. And in that week, Science Magazine is an article shooting bullets through graphene sheets. <laughs> and someone had done a scientific study shooting little quartz pellets at sheets of graphene and measuring how much energy was necessary in order to penetrate the graphene. Right? Dynamic mechanical behavior of multilayer graphene via supersonic projectile penetration. I tell you, they can make anything sound dull. <laughs> anyway, uh, when you look at it and you look at the specific penetration energy, the energy necessary to penetrate the graphene, uh, or, or penetrate, any, any, pe penetrate any material, excuse me, here are standard metals. This is Kevlar. So it's much harder to penetrate Kevlar than it would be to penetrate a, a, a thick metal. This is graphene up here. So this would be, if you wanted to make a bulletproof invisible shield, I'd do it out of graphene. The only problem is we don't know how to make graphene large enough to cover a person, cover you know, a city, to make that in, impenetrable force dome that I've been promised. <laughs> so once again, another, another problem for you guys to deal with. Uh, when realizing that I had this comic book and science magazine coming out in the very same week, making exactly the same scientific point that graphene is bulletproof, I figured I had to write something up. And I wrote an essay for Wired uh, Online that was published. And what I really loved about this were the comment section following my story. And one person in particular wanted to know what's protecting his hair then. <laughs> and before I had a chance to even pop in on the comic board, so a comment board, somebody had the perfect response. 
Real cream, stopping bullets since 1928. <laughs> so this raises the issue, what determines a material strength? And it really comes down to geometry and chemistry. So let me talk about geometry first. And I'll do it in the context of Gore Mu, uh, who appeared in a 1980s issue of Fantastic Four. And in this issue of the Fantastic Four was a story taking place before the Fantastic Four had gained their powers. And Gore Mu was an invader from outer space. And the whole thing was a throwback to the comics that Marvel Comics used to publish before they put out superhero comic books. Before they published the Fantastic Four or Spider-Man or the Avengers, they published comics, but they were science fiction and fantasy comics that like Tales to Astonish or Journey into Mystery. And every month, Earth was challenged, was attacked by some sort of giant monster. Here we see Tales to Astonish, number 13. I challenged Groot, the monster from Planet X. This is actually the same Groot who shows up in the Guardians of the Galaxy, though back in 1962, he had more of a vocabulary. And he goes, behold, I am Groot, the invincible, who dares to defy me? And in every month, in every issue, these giant monsters came and the local law enforcement couldn't stop them. The military was helpless. And Earth would be doomed if not for the efforts of one lone scientist who inevitably figured out the Achilles heel and the one weakness to defeat the invader. And here we see, so here's Groot attacking Earth. And here's Evans, the scientist. I defy you, Groot. I shall destroy you before midnight. And here's the very last panel of the story. And here's the sheriff saying, well, I'll be. I never even thought of that. And the townsperson says, that's why Evans is a scientist. And you're only a sheriff. And Evan's wife hugs him saying, oh, darling, forgive me. I've been such a fool. I'll never complain about you again. Never. Personally, I can't tell you how often I hear that in my own household. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you because it involves imaginary numbers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it's a good thing that these scientists were on the case. Because if they didn't have to deal with Groot then they had to contend with Lokar, or Orgo, or Mumba, or Rambu, or Gruto, or Brutu, or Gugam, son of Goom, or Fin Fang Foom, <laughs> all of which pale against the most horrifying monster of all, the tax collector from outer space. <laughs> I like that he's even taking quarters. <laughs> But actually, I, I, I was using this and it's giving this talk, and I started to think about why back in the 60s, in the comic books, and it's not just the Marvel comics, it's not just these stories, but in DC comics and in general, the scientists were held to be much more respected than we see today. There was no, their, their authority was honored. And I thought about this, and I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that this was the 1960s, and we're talking about only not even 20 years from the end of World War II. And science really had a contribution, played, you know, helped play a role in, in fighting World War II. Not just the atomic bomb, but also the development of radar and the proximity fuse. And these things started to show up and have non-military applications. So we see atomic power for electricity generation. We see in radar, obviously, commercial aviation. And even the proximity fuse, we're seeing this today in the self-parking cars and self-driving cars. That technology is uh, still in play. And people, at the time, the technology was more visible that it was impossible to ignore the contribution of scientists and engineers. 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright take their first successful flights at Kitty Hawk. 
the longest of which didn't even last a full minute. 66 years later, Neil Armstrong walks on the moon. So you go in two generations from Kitty Hawk to Apollo 11. And that radical transformation in, in transportation is impossible to ignore. And it's very clear the contributions being made. And now the, there are these amazing advances. You guys know full well how difficult it is to get advances in the current technology and how hard you have to push. But so much of it seems, it remains unseen, is behind the screen, and is not evident. And so, but we should take an opportunity whenever we can to communicate and share with people about these accomplishments because we're all contributing to it. Because even if you're not in this room doing the research or doing the work and advancing technology, and for most of the people that I give this talk, they are not scientists or engineers, but they all are citizens and voters. And as citizens and voters, we all have a responsibility uh, as we make decisions to make them that are technically sound and not just sound technical. Uh, so back to Gormu and the cube square law. We see, here we go, here, so here's Gormu in that issue of Fantastic Four. And uh, here he is first coming to the planet and he's met by the scientist Reed Richards. My name is Reed Richards, can you understand me? He goes, I can. My name is Gormu. I am a warrior of Kralo. They always had these multiple <laughs> vowels. Not quite clear why. Um, now, Gormu's competitive advantage in the world conquering business was that any time you struck him with any blast, any bomb, any missile, any type of energy, he got bigger. So how do you fight someone that every time you hit them, they get bigger? Well, the scientist Reed Richards has an idea. To test the idea, he goes back to where Gormu first landed. He uh, takes a small wooden ruler from my pocket and tests, does a measurement to test his hypothesis and concludes that the only way to stop Gormu is to blast him continuously with a beam of broadcast energy. Well, I have no idea what that is. Uh, and at first, Gormu uh, is pleased. He goes, no, not a weapon, a power beam. Yes, yes, give me more power. But wait, something is wrong. The power surges within me, but I do not grow stronger. I grow weaker. I am almost as big as the planet, yet I do no damage. I am as if I am no more than a phantom. What is happening to me? I am defeated. No. And when Gormu gone, Reed Richards explains to his girlfriend Sue Storm and his friend Ben Grimm that um, Gormu was getting bigger, but he was growing at constant mass, not constant density. And Reed Richards verified that by realizing that his footprints were getting bigger, but they were not getting deeper. And I realized even though Gormu was gaining size, he was not gaining mass or weight. He was just inflating. And then Sue Storm says, oh Reed, darling, I'll never doubt you again. <laughs> But this is, in fact, exactly right. This is a, a, an important point about the, the square cube law, that mass, mass over volume is the density, which means mass is density times volume. And if you grow a constant density, then as you get bigger, your volume increases, your mass increases. But uh, if, when Gormu increased at constant mass, as his volume got bigger, his density went down. I mean, we know this, say, if you want to hold up a 40-pound fish using a fishing line that's rated for only 20 pounds, you don't make the line longer, you make it thicker. Because the strength of materials is determined by the cross-sectional area, where the size is determined by the, the, the length cubed. And this is, of course, illustrated in The Unbeatable Squirrel Girl in her physics class, 
And the physics professor says, put another way, make yourself 10 times larger. Your muscles get 100 times as big, but you have to carry 1,000 times more weight. That's why elephants look like elephants and not like giant mice. You can't just scale up the animals and expect them to work. I drew them for you because I am a good professor. <laughs> and that raises the issue that for big objects, the ratio of the surface area to volume is small. But for small objects, the ratio of surface area to volume is big. As also illustrated in Squirrel Girl's physics class, Square cube law, as things get bigger, their surface area is a square of the growth factor, but their volume is cubed. Galileo discovered it. I drew him for you because I am a good professor. <laughs> now you know what you should be looking for in a professor. <laughs> so a brief interlude on nanotechnology or the size matter. <laughs> I know, bad joke. <laughs> a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And basically, an easy way to think of how big a nanometer is, is it is the length of three atoms end to end. We are designing materials on the nanometer length scale. And as we do so, all sorts of new physics comes into play. And it's going to be your job to figure this all out. Why are we doing this? What is the advantage of making things on the nanometer length scale? Well, if you had a sphere with a radius of one nanometer, it would have only 200 atoms. And there's two advantages to making things on a nanometer length scale, surface area and volume. Regarding surface area, when I said that, so the surface area to volume ratio is large for small nanocrystals, that one nanometer sphere with 200 atoms, 140 of those atoms are on the outside surface. A lot of chemistry gets catalyzed on surfaces. So it's a very effective way to speed up chemical reactions. And it's also a very effective way, if you have, you have a material that's practically all surface, then you attach a drug, you know, some sort of medicine molecule to the nanocrystal, and none of it's getting wasted because it's, all, it's practically all surface. And so it makes it very efficient for drug delivery. The other thing to look at is volume. As you make the nanocrystal smaller and smaller, the electrons eventually start to realize that they're inside a box. And as you squeeze on the box, the properties of the electrons through quantum mechanics change. And what this means is that the properties of the material become sensitive to the size of the nanocrystal, or another way of putting it, it frees us from the tyranny of chemistry. And what I mean by that is say you have window glass. And one of the, the striking features of window glass is that you can see through it. And you can see through it because it doesn't absorb any visible light. The visible light is ignored by the window material, the silicon dioxide, and passes right through. If you want to change the color of the window glass, you have to change its chemical composition. You have to put other elements into the window chromium, vanadium, selenium, and these materials stain the glass. What they're really doing is absorbing different wavelengths of visible light so that the light passing through no longer is white light, but it now has a particular color. But by doing that, you're changing the properties of the window in the way you want, but you're also changing the chemical composition of the window, and sometimes changing the chemistry changes other properties that you don't want to vary. So a way to get around that is through nanotechnology. Here are a series of vials containing the same element, silicon nanocrystals. And when you shine ultraviolet light on the silicon nanocrystals, they glow and give off some visible light. And all that ha happens to go from red to orange, yellow, green, purple, is the size of the silicon nanocrystals is being decreased. So these are big nanocrystals in the red, and these are small nanocrystals in the purple blue. And so you have, you can change the color, and I don't have to add another element, I don't have to stain the nanocrystal, I just change the size and I can change the properties. And this is really powerful 
because now this gives us another tool to change the properties of materials and change their, their behavior. So now we, have, we suddenly have another knob that we can turn. And so that's going to open up tremendous applications. Uh, chemistry also determines the strength of materials. And I like to illustrate that by talking about superhero costumes. Right? In order to avoid sanctions from the Comics Code Authority, superhero costumes have to adapt whenever the heroes use their amazing powers. Right? Think about Marvel Girl and her costume stretches when she stretches her body, or Elastic Girl of the Doom Patrol. She becomes much bigger. Her costume becomes much bigger. Here we have Elastic Girl of the Incredibles, whose costume also stretches. We have Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. His costume stretches. In fact, all of their costumes follow their superpowers. Sue Storm is the Invisible Woman. When she turns invisible, her costume becomes invisible so that you can't see her at all. So it's not like she's invisible, but the costume is just still floating around there. Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, he flames on, and his costume doesn't burn off, so that when he flames back off, his costume is back there. And the thing has little blue shorts. <laughs> In the comics, this is explained by saying that Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four have a special costume composed of unstable molecules, which can stretch and contract as his body does. And here we see, here's the human torch. My suit is made of unstable molecules. In their normal state, they look like this. <laughs> but as my flame increases, they vary their structure depending on the degree of heat. Now, this may seem ridiculous. Of course, we know that there are unstable molecules. They're the ones that explode. But there is materials that do behave like this. They're called therm shape memory materials. And they're called, uh, they have a thermal response, uh, responsive materials. So you can take them and you can deform them, stretch them, and then if you modestly heat them, they snap back to their original shape. Uh, polymers like shrink wrap, if you ever bought something that was shrink wrapped, that was wrapped in, a, in the, the shrink wrap material that was loose, sealed up, and then you heat it up and it, got, it contracted and formed a tight seal around uh, uh, anything. Metal alloys like nitinol and flexon that when you bend them, you can warm them up and they snap back. And what this is doing is it's undergoing a phase transition. We're used to phase transitions like ice melting into water or water boiling into steam. But there are phase transitions where we take the object and we push on it. We shear it, and it changes from one crystal structure to another. And then you warm it up slightly, and it snaps back to the original crystal structure and the original shape. Uh, so uh, polymers, uh, so there are some uh, uh, material scientists developing polymers for use as surgical sutures that can self-tighten so you can make a, a small incision, make a loose little knot, and then the heat of the body tightens it up. So you can get by with a smaller cut. Uh, smart fabrics used in mountaineering and outdoor activities, some of them expand when you lower the temperature, which increases the insulation. Other materials increase their porosity upon warming, allowing the body heat and water to escape. Just this past year, Stanford researchers reported developing nanoporous materials that let both perspiration and the infrared light that you're emitting when you're hot escape, but block the visible light. So these are like super coolant materials because they're structured on the nanoscale. But it's not just the costumes, it's also the accessories. Uh, so we could talk about Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman, one of her accessories is she fights crime with a lasso of truth. And I don't know if you know why she has a lasso of truth. Wonder Woman was created in 1941 by Dr. William Moulton Marston, who was one of the co-inventors of the lie detector. So that's why her, she has a lasso that compels you to always tell the truth. And the other uh, feature of her costume that's notable is that using her Amazonian reflexes and strength, she can deflect bullets off of her bracelet. Uh, assuming that they ricochet from the bracelets in the first place. 
So we can use physics to figure out what kind of materials these are. We have, say, a 22 caliber bullet. We can look up its, its mass, about 0.02 kilograms. If it's traveling 1,000 feet per second, that's nearly the speed of sound, and it ricochets in a millisecond off of the bullet, then we use force equals mass, uh, mass times acceleration. For the acceleration, the change in velocity is 2v. We bring the delta t over here. This is 2mv. Another way to say it, it's 2 times the momentum. In physics, we represent the momentum by the letter p because it stands for momentum. <laughs> Rocket scientists. Well, we know its mass. We know how fast it's going. If it ricochets, goes in, and comes back, the change in momentum is 2 times mv. If it ricochets in a millisecond, a thousandth of a second, the force is about 2,700 pounds. We can look up the, the cross-sectional area of a bullet, and we find a pressure of 70,000 PSI, compressive strength. What kind of metal could support that kind of compressive pressure? Pretty much all of them. <laughs> uh, high strength steel alloys can easily withstand pressures over 75,000 PSI. So apparently Amazonian metal is nothing more exotic than cold rolled steel. But if I'm talking about the strength of materials and metals, I have to conclude by addressing one of the great mysteries in metallurgy, the chem chemical composition of Captain America's shield. Captain America first appeared in 1941, actually in March 1941, a good eight months before Pearl Harbor, but Cap doesn't believe in waiting until the last minute and is punching Hitler uh, <laughs> long before the US entered World War II. And initially, when he first appeared, he had a triangular shield, which was remarkably similar to the triangular shield worn by another patriotic superhero already being published by another comic book company. And the Shield's lawyers talked to Captain America's lawyers, and Captain America got a, a circular shield that, uh, with which he has fought uh, ever, with uh, injustice ever since. And this shield has remarkable properties. Uh, it has great strength and rigidity. Here we see Cap throwing it so, so fast that it's splitting a machine gun in half or here an oak table. Uh, here it's ricocheting off of different surfaces. So, and it only does this if it's very stiff and rigid. But it's also like a perfect shock absorber. Here he's deflecting a uh, kick from Batroc Zilliper. Uh, here a, uh, someone is shooting at him. He's deflecting the bullet with, with his shield. This is a member of Advanced Idea Mechanics, a group of super scientists. Uh, we know they're super scientists because he's wearing a garbage can on his head. <laughs> uh, here he's deflecting a blast or a death ray. So it is both st st stiff and rigid, so it ricochets. And it's soft and squishy, so that makes it a great shock absorber. If you want to absorb a punch, you want to hold up a pillow or a mattress. You don't want to hold up like a, a rigid piece of metal because that's going to come right back at you. But if you want something to bounce off the wall, you want to throw that rigid piece of metal. You don't want to throw a mattress. So you uh, need something that will take all that energy. You need to convert it into a different form of, uh, a different form of energy. So uh, here we see from the first Avengers film, Thor comes in to strike Cap shield, and the vi vibrations in the shield are converted into light, which is what's called sonoluminescence. So this is a real phenomena where lattice vibrations in a solid can be converted to photons of light. We don't usually see this, because usually it, we don't have Thor's hammer coming down on Cap shield. What, so that, again, what is the chemical composition of Cap shield? The shield was created in a lab accident by metallurgist Dr. Myron McLean in Captain America 303. And it's a unique alloy of steel and vibranium. And vibranium is a mineral, an extraterrestrial mineral, 
that is only found in the African nation of Wakanda. And vibranium absorbs all vibrations, making it the perfect shock absorber. So you have the steel for the strength and rigidity, and you have the vibranium as the shock absorber. And I'm not really making this up. Here we see our virtually inexhaustible supply of vibranium comes from the sacred mound, which has bordered the land of the Wakandans since the dawn of time. Right? And you know, from Captain America Civil War, this gif is in plain, I apologize, but here uh, the Black Panther has a suit made out of vibranium, which makes it nice and bulletproof. So, is this really true? As material scientists, we rely on experimental testing. And really, there's only one person who can verify the truthiness of the chemical composition of Captain America's shield, Stephen Colbert. So, here we go. So, and that was before the movies. That was just when he was a total nerd. <laughs> so, if you ever want to know what it sounds like when you strike an object that absorbs all vibrations, now you know. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, and remember, with physics comes great power, but also great responsibility. <laughs>